Now, the title of the sermon this morning is The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived. The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived. And we base this on Matthew 11, the, the, the words of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, Jesus Christ, being both man and God, is the greatest man that ever lived. But we'll say that, you know, but he's God, right? But Jesus pointed out somebody who was the greatest man that ever lived. And that was John the Baptist. Look at what Jesus says about John the Baptist. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Man, wouldn't you, wouldn't you like that to be said about you? <laughs> you know, say of all the people that are born of women, Jesus himself is saying, hey, that's John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, and this is even more profound, notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So even though John the Baptist was such a great preacher, such a great man of God, Jesus says that the least person in heaven is even greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because John the Baptist still has sins, right? But the least in the kingdom of heaven, you know, when, we, when we're in the kingdom of heaven, we're sinless, right? So the greatest man that ever lived. So let's talk a bit about, let's look into this greatest man that ever lived and uh, let's learn a bit about it, right? So we, we saw as we read through Luke 1, John's birth, right? John's birth. So a couple of things we want to point out uh, in Luke chapter 1. See verse 5, it says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So you can see here that you know, Elizabeth was cousins with Mary, but then obviously Joseph was of the line of Judah. Right? Zacharias was, of, was a priest. Right? So what does that mean? So that means Zacharias and you know, uh, Elizabeth was of the daughters of Aaron. Right? So these guys were Levites. So if you say, like, well, what was, what was John the Baptist? Well, John the Baptist, he was of the tribe of Levi. Right? So he was a Levite. So, uh, you know, it's, it's just in, interesting there to know, like, you know, what his uh, lineage is, and he's in the, the tribe of Levi. <laughs> verse 7, we see in Luke 1, verse 7, and they, that's Zach, Zacharias, <coughs> me, and Elizabeth, it says, and they had... <coughs> No, excuse me. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and both were now well stricken in years. So we can see that John the Baptist's parents had a similar story to Abraham and Sarah, where they were, Sarah was quite uh, mature aged, right? She was older in years and, you know, she was barren. She, didn't, she did not have a child. And this is Zacharias' um, wife was the same. Uh, but we see here in verse 13, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. So even though his wife was older in years and she was barren, he was still praying that his wife could have a child. And eventually his prayer was answered by God. And thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. So just like Jesus' name was appointed by God, John's name was appointed by God as well. Let's jump down to verse 17. He shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, people have different opinions on John the Baptist. Some people believe that he is actually Elijah, like basically come back, right, as John the Baptist. I personally don't believe that. I personally believe that what Jesus is saying, that this is Elias, which was for to come. I believe in Luke 1, we get the explanation of what that Old Testament verse and what Jesus is quoting means. So I think that John the Baptist is just coming in the spirit and power of Elias, but I don't, I don't believe John the Baptist is actually Elias. Uh, but some people believe he is, and there's different theories there. <clears throat> but I just thought I'd point that out in Luke 1, uh, verse 17. Luke 1, verse 36, And behold, thy cousin, Elizabeth, she, also, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So this is something I find interesting, and, and you know, we don't know the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. We know that their mothers were cousins, and you know that John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. Right, so he's six months older because at six months of age, that's when the, the angel came to 
Mary and told her that she would conceive Jesus. And then when, uh, I think Mary, uh, from when she heard, and you remember she went to go see uh, Elizabeth, she was with her for three months. So that's the nine months that Mary was pregnant. So John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. But when John the Baptist was, you know, grow, uh, born and he was growing, he grew up, you know, he went out into the wilderness. So I don't know at what age he went out to the wilderness and whether or not he knew Jesus as a child or maybe he didn't know him growing up. And that's why when Jesus came to get baptized, you know, I'm not sure what their relationship was like there, but it'd be interesting to <laughs> find out one day. Um, you know, how they grew up as children. Luke 1, verse 44, For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And this is something interesting about John the Baptist, and it, and it kind of ties into this pro-life argument as well, that, you know, obviously the Bible, you know, teaches that life begins at conception. And something interesting about John the Baptist is, you remember, the angel came to Mary in Luke 1, told Mary that she would have a baby. Now, now when, when she conceived of, you know, of the Holy Ghost, because the Holy Ghost overshadows her, when she finds that out, she goes to see Elizabeth. And when she goes to see Elizabeth, who is the first human being that actually acknowledges the presence of Jesus as, as, you know, besides Mary, right? Well, it was a baby in a womb. Like, it was John the Baptist. John the Baptist, so a baby in the womb, leapt for joy, was happy to know that Jesus had been conceived in Mary's womb. So, you know, a lot of people, you know, you know they believe, you know, obviously, you know, babies, you know, they can have abortion, which is murder, right? But we can see here that, you know, you know John the Baptist was a baby in the womb acknowledging the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in Mary's womb. So that's a few points about um, the birth story of John's birth in Luke 1. Let's go on to number two, which was John's message. John's message. Are we, so we're learning a bit about the greatest man that ever lived, John the Baptist, right? John's message. Well, we see his ministry start in Matthew 3. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? So a lot of people you know, misunderstand what repentance is in regards to salvation. They, they also misunderstand that John the Baptist, you know, John the Baptist preached a lot of things. Everything he preached is not the baptism of repentance. The baptism of repentance was one thing he preached. Right? So yes, he did come preaching the baptism of repentance, saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, a lot of people misunderstand repentance in regards to salvation, and they think repentance means a turning away from sin. They believe it means, you know, uh, committing your life to Jesus and turning away from, uh, you know, doing wrong and trying to do what's right. And they think this is what John the Baptist is preaching in order to obtain salvation. Now, if that was his message, that would be a works-based salvation, because, you know, in order to turn away from sin, you have to keep the commandments. And if you have to keep the commandments in order to get saved, that's a works-based salvation. So what is the message of John the Baptist? Well, we don't have to guess what John the Baptist's message is when he's preaching the baptism of repentance because Paul, in Acts 19, defines what the baptism of repentance is that John the Baptist was preaching and that Jesus continued to preach after John the Baptist was cast into prison. Acts 19, verse 4, says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, look at this, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So don't get confused with what repentance is in regards to salvation. Repentance means we are turning from something, right? Now, as Christians, as saved believers, can we turn from sin and keep the commandments? Yes, right? So there is a repentance from sin for the Christian, for the saved believer trying to live right. But when we talk about repentance in regards to salvation, what are we turning from in order to get saved? Well, the Bible defines it in Hebrews 6. We are turning from dead works. What is dead works? Dead works is when you are trying to work your way to heaven, right? Either it's a false religion or you're trusting in work salvation and you turn from that and you trust on Jesus Christ, right? That's the repentance when it comes to salvation. So what is the turning? It's the turning from dead works and it's to believe on him which should come after him. 
that is on Christ Jesus. Why? Because turning from dead works is a substitute for Jesus, right? You can't believe on Jesus and be believing on dead works. But you can be believing on Jesus and still be sinning. Right? That's what we do every day. Everyone sins, right? So these, these are two different things. So don't get that confused. That is the message, the message of the baptism of repentance from John the Baptist. But this is not the only thing that John the Baptist preached. Right? And this is where people get confused because people say, well, what was John's message? And, they, and John also taught about how to live. Right? But that wasn't the baptism of repentance. The baptism of repentance was believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's look a bit further into, into Matthew 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So notice that you know, the Bible never says repent of your sins. You know, people just assume that repent means repent of your sins. He's just saying repent. because there's a, Like I said, there's a repentance in regards to salvation and there's a repentance in regards to the Christian life too saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment, so his clothing, of camel's hair, and a leathern, leathern girdle about his loins. So when John the Baptist is generally depicted in movies and cartoons, he's got a scruffy-looking birth because they think he's living in the wilderness. Right? He's got camel's hair, his clothing, a, a leather girdle, like a, a belt about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. So I don't know if that means that's the only thing he ate, but, you know, the Bible says that's what he was his mainstay. His food was, you know, locusts, which is like a grasshopper, and, and the wild honey of the field. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea. So people, so this man was such a bold preacher, a uh, preacher of God's word, that people actually went out into the wilderness to hear him preach the things that he preached and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins so obviously this is what John the Baptist we call him John the Baptist because you know he was sent to baptize that's what he's most famous for and I won't go too much into baptism uh, because we talked about that a couple of weeks ago but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism he said unto them O generation of vipers who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourself. So what is he talking about here to these religious leaders to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance? Is he saying you, know, you have to work your way to heaven? No, he's saying because they're thinking within themselves, hey, because Abraham is their father, they, you know, they're fine. And he's saying to them, no, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. So being a son of Abraham is not going to get you saved. You need to become a son of God. You need to believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water. So we already talked about that, what John the Baptist did. Unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So doesn't that line up with Acts 19, right? Where he's saying, hey, this is what the Baptist is to pointing people to Jesus. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? So you, you can see the meekness and the humbleness of John here when Jesus comes to him and he's saying, hey, you're meant to be, I'm telling everyone that you're going to baptize everyone, and you're coming to me to basically you know, be, be in subjection to my ministry. Right? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. What does that mean? Allow it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then... He suffered him. So we see there that baptism is not, it's not required for salvation, but it's something that we do to obey God. And that's why when Jesus did it, he was fulfilling the commandment to obey God, to, to be baptized. Matthew 3.16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So John's message and ministry he preached the baptism of repentance we talked about that 
You know, we saw him rebuke the religious leaders of his day as well, right? So you can see that, you know, it's, it's, he's, he's, he preached other things too, and we'll look, look at that a bit later on. But we see here in verse 13 to 15 as well <laughs> that he, you know, submitted to the will of God, even if it didn't make sense to him. You know, this is one thing about John the Baptist. If Jesus comes to him, you know, it might have made him feel uncomfortable. He wasn't, you know, but he submitted to the will of God anyway. And that's one thing that John the Baptist did. All right, let's learn a bit more about John the Baptist. So number three, we're going to look at John's ministry. John's ministry in uh, John chapter three. Look at this in verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And we know that even though Jesus, you know, the Bible saying that he baptized there, we know that it was his disciples that were baptizing uh, in another verse. But he's over there, so now he's baptizing people too. And obviously that is taking away from John's ministry, right? And John also was baptizing in Anan near, Sa near to Salem because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, so that's when he said to Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So you can see that the disciples of John sometimes have the wrong you know, priorities, right? They're thinking, oh, you know, this guy's ministry is joining, you know, growing, he's taking away from your ministry. Because sometimes, you know, when we walk by sight rather than faith, you know, we, we kind of compare the physical, right? And people might compare ministries and go, oh, look how many people I have versus how many people you have. And this is what's happening with John the Baptist's disciples. Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. So isn't that like such a humble attitude of John? And he doesn't look at the numbers within his ministry, the people that he's ministering to and think how great a job he's doing. He's saying, hey, I don't have anything. It's, it's given to me by God. God, you know, it's like Jesus is the one that builds the church. Jesus is the one that brings people here. And that's a good perspective to have. So we don't get too high-minded and we trust God to work in people's hearts. You know? uh, John 3, verse 28. Ye yourselves bear witness, bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So what do we see from this passage here? We see that John's ministry is decreasing as Jesus' increases. Right? So we know that he was very humble. Right? He was very meek. He knew his place with God. You know, he wasn't trying to lift himself up. He wanted to lift Jesus Christ up. So what are we talking about here this morning? We're talking about the greatest man that ever lived. What are some aspects of John the Baptist's life that made him so great? Well, we see his message. Right? We see here his ministry. He didn't lift himself up. He lifted up Jesus Christ. And I just had this underline here verse 24 because we're going to see something very interesting here in the next passage we look at john was not yet cast into prison so we can see there that jesus's ministry is starting to grow john the baptist is starting to decrease right but at this point he's not yet in prison matthew 4 now when jesus had heard that john was cast into prison he departed into galilee and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulun and Nephthalim, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light has sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So one thing I want to point out here, and I don't know if you'd notice this when you read your Bible, is that, you know, John recognized, hey, I'm pointing people to Jesus. And we're talking about how meek and humble he was. You know, I don't know if you realize this, but then as John the Baptist's ministry is decreasing and Jesus is, is increasing, who he's baptizing, 
It's not until John the Baptist is actually cast into prison that Jesus' ministry, he then picks up the torch from there and then goes out and starts his ministry, preaching, repent, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what I sort of want you to notice here, what I thought was really interesting, you know, we think about, you know, his ministry decreasing. I mean, it decreased to the point where he's now in prison. And if you know the story of John, we're going to look at it a bit later. You know, that's where his life actually ends. So, you know, this man who was such a bold preacher, such a great preacher of God, you know, really had this kind of anticlimactic end, right? So it shows that the, the greatest man who ever lived didn't need to necessarily go out with a public bang. His ministry decreased so point that Jesus' ministry took over, right? Where he's in prison and now Jesus is out there uh, preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Because, and I, the reason why I point this out, and I think it's interesting, I just, I just think it's interesting that that's the time when Jesus started. Because probably when you think about, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus, um, you know, in the New Testament, you probably think that their ministries were going side by side, which at a point they were. But when Jesus' ministry really took off and he actually started going out there preaching the word, it was when John the Baptist was cast into prison. See, look, Matthew 4, 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, then he's going out preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, as John is saying, I must decrease, he must increase. It was literally like a torch passing from one to the other. And now John is in prison. John 4. Oh, sorry, no, number four, John's persecution. So we looked at John's you know, birth. We looked at John's message. We were looking at John's ministry just then. Now we're going to look at John's persecution. Why was he cast into prison? Well, let's look at Luke 3. And the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? So here is in Luke 3, we looked at Matthew 3. Well, it was mainly about him preaching the baptism of repentance, rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees, saying, hey, think not to say within yourselves we have Abraham to our father. But in Luke 3, we get a bit more about what John the Baptist preached. And this is where sometimes people get confused about what is, you know, what is repentance. Just, just because John the Baptist is preaching other topics, that doesn't mean he's, you know, that all has to do with the baptism of repentance, right? Luke 3, verse 10, the people asked him, saying, hey, what shall we do then? So here is now people asking, like a Q&A, where he's asking John the Baptist, hey, how should we live our lives? What are some things that we should do? He answereth and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So, all right, so these are some things that John the Baptist is saying, hey, this is how people should be generous, do things. Now, does this, do these have anything to do with salvation? Now, if somebody said to you, what, am I, what must I do to be saved? And you say, hey, if you have two coats, let him, that imp you know, let him impart to him that hath none. So do we need to now do charitable deeds in order to get to heaven? So you see how not everything that John the Baptist talks about is the baptism of repentance. There's salvation, but he's also teaching about how to live, right? A right way to live, which, which is separate from salvation. Then came also publicans to him. Publicans to be baptized. So what are publicans? Publicans are tax collectors, right? People that work for the ATO. <laughs> and the people asked them, saying, uh, what shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, he that hath two coats, let him impart to him that... Oh, wait. Then came also publicans, sorry, verse 12, to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, exact no more than that which is appointed you. So what is he telling the publicans? Don't steal from people because they're going around collecting taxes, and he's saying, don't say they owe, owe this much when they don't owe that much, and, and, and basically use your authority to steal from people, to, to take, take, take their uh, productive wealth. Uh, verse 14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So notice, he didn't tell them to stop being soldiers. So being a soldier is not, not inherently violent, because violence is when you, you know, impose violence onto people that are uh, innocent, right? And in war, it's a, it's a different situation. But you know, obviously, you know, people that are in, like the police, like we've seen over the last couple of years, people in police, people in the army, you know, they can abuse that authority and do violence to people. John is saying, hey, do violence to no man. Neither accuse any falsely. Oh, man, I mean, we see some of that in the last couple of years when cops are just like, you know, pick you up and say that you're doing this and try and get you in trouble. 
Be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them, Oh, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So see how he's just like teaching the people just certain things about life? Now, people are still wondering whether he's the Christ, but he always pointed people back to Jesus, saying, No, I'm just baptizing you with the water. There's one coming after me. Verse 17, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. unquenchable. Verse 18, look, and many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. Do you see there? So, you, so that, I'm just making the point that John the Baptist's message was not only salvation. He did preach as well how to live. And he preached many other things that are not even written in the Bible. So we don't know everything he preached because I'm sure he's preaching day after day after day. He's probably teaching people a lot of things about the Word of God. So why did he get thrown into prison? But Herod the Tetrarch being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John. In prison. So John was basically saying to the king at the time, he, told, he was telling the king off, saying it was not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Right? So, and that was who Herodias was. So Herodias didn't like John the Baptist saying that the king shouldn't be taking his brother's wife. And because of that, he had thrown John into prison. So what are some things we can see from you know, John's persecution? That he preached the word of God faithfully even when it got him into trouble, right? So that's what made John the Baptist a great preacher as well. All right, let's get on to number five. Let's look at John's temptation. John's temptation. Now, temptation in the Bible doesn't only mean that you're tempted with, like, to lust after something, right? Temptation also means your trials. I've just used this the word in the Bible context. John's temptation. Matthew 11, verse 2. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now this is what's interesting here. This is the greatest, and Jesus said, there's none born among women greater than John the Baptist. And even the greatest man that ever lived, according to Jesus, is now in prison doubting the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this is the man we see in John 1. The next day, this is when, when, when Jesus comes to John. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I, I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. So, so John the Baptist, even before Jesus starts his ministry, he's preaching the baptism of repentance. He's preaching that there's one coming after me that's greater than me. I, I can't even untie his shoelaces and then the man appears and he says behold the lamb of god which taketh away the sin of the world this is he and then when he's cast into prison can you imagine this man saying this art thou he that should come or do we look for another but it just goes to show it's an encouragement to us right that even the greatest man that ever lived can have times of faith that are up and down Right, he's in prison. I mean, think about this. Like, you know, he's, he's not amongst Jesus seeing the miracles and seeing all these things. Right? He's in prison. He got cast into prison. He's hearing about these things. Oh, well, we'll just skip over John. So there's a bit more about, um, you know, what John saw um, with Jesus. Matthew 11. Let's go on to uh, verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? I'll just stop there, because I just want to make a comment here on verse uh, 6. So, so I want you to just understand the situation here because to me, I, like, you know, you think these great men of God are just, you know, 
you know, so, so perfect. But we see here, even this great man of God who pointed out to Jesus, behold the Lamb of God, this is he, he's in here in prison doubting. It kind of reminds you of Job. You know, even though Job was this uh, great man in the earth, a great godly man, but when he, you know, came into temptation, you know, sometimes they, they were tested. So being a great man of God or a great woman of God doesn't mean you don't struggle, right? That you don't have temptation, that you don't have trials, that you don't have troubles in your life. But it's how you handle these, right? So John the Baptist is here in prison. And it's not that Jesus doesn't even come to see him in prison. You know, Jesus didn't visit him in prison. You know, John's asking his disciples, is this Jesus? And Jesus just sends his disciples to just tell him, no, just have John believe, you know, what he's hearing, right? Then he goes on to talk about this. So whilst, isn't this interesting, that whilst John is doubting Jesus in prison, and Jesus just tells the disciples, his disciples to go and just tell him, hey, people are getting healed, miracles are happening, all these things that you preach that would happen are happening, right? You just need to believe it. While he's down, then this is when Jesus says these words. You know, what went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? So what is he saying here? He's saying like, well, who do you think John is? Is he a reed shaken with the wind? What does that mean? Is he, is he a man without a backbone? No, he was a bold preacher, right? Is he a man clothed in soft raiment? What does that mean? Is he just somebody that just has all the delicacies in life, a man of authority, he's got the life that's easy? No, I mean, he was out in the wilderness eating locusts and wild honey, clothed in camels, camels here. Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's house. He didn't get a privileged life. They that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. Why are they called soft clothing? Because usually the expensive stuff, you know, wool, silk, things like that, expensive clothing. But what went you out for to see? A prophet? He's saying, is John the Baptist just a prophet? He says, no, yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So he's saying, hey, John the Baptist was not just any prophet. He was the one that was to prepare the way before the coming of God himself in the flesh. Verily, and then look, this is when he says in verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So we're talking about the greatest man that ever lived. His faith was tested. Now, Jesus didn't take him out of prison like Peter and Paul. He stayed in prison. So we have people like John the Baptist, and, and I think it's an encouragement to us because sometimes we think, you know, why does God allow me to go through this? We see Job went through trials. John the Baptist went through trials. And I, I think even as he began to doubt, I mean, this is when John, or Jesus, is actually, you know, talking him up and saying how great he is. So just so as great men of God and great women of God can have ups and downs in their faith. You know, John the Baptist had to believe what Jesus did because he didn't see it. And I think this is one of the things that also made him great because look at what Jesus says in John 20. He says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. So this is when Jesus appears to his disciples. Remember doubting Thomas, didn't believe it? But then the second time he comes, Thomas is there. He says, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Look what Jesus says. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. He says, it's more blessed to believe the word of God and to see it, right? And I think that's why John was, you know, given that opportunity to be like that because, I mean, he was there baptizing, he's preaching about this man coming. And then when he comes, he didn't get to see it all, right? <laughs> he's in prison the whole time. But then, you know, this, this is why. I think that this is one of the reasons why it made him so great. Number six, John's execution. 
Mark 6, for Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For he had married him. For John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. So see how he was bold enough, even the king, to tell the king off, to say, look, it's not right for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias, which is a woman's name, that's, that was Philip's wife, had, was upset with him. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and a holy, and observed him. So Herodias wanted to kill John the Baptist, but Herod didn't want to because he knew that he was from God. But then we read on. He did many things and heard him gladly. And when a convenient day was come, that Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he swear unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. Now, obviously, <coughs> if, that, that's just a saying, right? So you'll see this saying throughout the Bible where people say, I'll give, it, I'll give it to you unto the half of my kingdom. I don't think if you actually ask for, you know, 49% of the kingdom from the king, that the king would give it to you. I think it's just a saying to say, look, you can, you can ask for something, but you can't replace me, right? That's basically what the saying is saying. So he's saying to Herodias' daughter who danced and pleased Herod, so Herod says foolishly to her, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. Well, let's read on. Verse 24. She went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. So it was Herodias that told her daughter, hey, now that Herod's going to give you anything, ask for John the Baptist to be executed. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will give thou, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. So you can see here, this is your king that he's made this silly promise and now he doesn't want to look silly in front of his nobles, so he goes and does the wrong thing and has John the Baptist executed. And immediately the king sent an executioner, commanded his head to be brought. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. So why is John the Baptist, you know, the greatest man that ever lived? We looked at some of the factors, but when we look at his ministry, you see there, when, when, when you read now, you know, he must increase, I must decrease. Now, it, hopefully that picture is a bit clearer of what that actually means. That didn't just mean that he kind of like, his ministry was smaller than Jesus and he was still doing his own thing. No, that meant that his ministry decreased, he was then thrown into prison, there, up until his death. He didn't even get to see the ministry of Jesus and things like that. Jesus didn't even go see him. He just sent disciples to go see him and to tell him about the things that were happening. So this is the end of John the Baptist. Not a glorious finish. But sometimes, you know, we, we can reflect on that in our own life. That, you know, sometimes the greatest men, godly men, godly women, sometimes they leave the world unnoticed. Right? But that doesn't mean that they're not a great man or a great woman of God. Probably the greatest, you know, the, these great men and women of God, you probably don't even know their names. You know, they're, probably, they're not famous, but they're out doing great things. They're great in the eyes of God. And one thing that ought to encourage us when we serve God with our life, it doesn't matter whether we get the praise of men. You know, what's more important that we get the praise of God. And even though Jesus did not physically visit John the Baptist in prison and he went and sent his disciples, Jesus knew about because right? we see here in Matthew 14, verse 12, and his disciples came, took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. So even though man may, may not notice us leave this world, uh, we can be encouraged and Jesus definitely knows how our life is lived. So a closing thought. So we learn about G John the Baptist's birth, some interesting points there. So hopefully just today's message you have learned a lot more about John the Baptist and just have a bit more full insight into his life and to his ministry. We've seen his message, you know, his ministry as it decreases, as Jesus increases. We see him cast into prison. That's when Jesus starts his ministry, right? In terms of going out and preaching, repent for the kingdom is at hand. We see that when he is in prison, even as a great preacher of God, he doubts 
even the things that he preached himself, that Jesus was the one, uh, the, 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 the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he needed to be reminded of those things. And even though Jesus sends his disciples to go remind him, that's when, funnily enough, Jesus says to his disciples that this is the greatest man that ever lived. It's not a greater than John the Baptist. And then we see John's execution at the end of his life where, you know, it's, 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 it's almost uh, quite a sad ending where the way he ended, you know, alone in a prison. And why did he get executed? Because of a silly promise from a king. But yet he's the greatest man that ever lived. So why, I want, I want to close on this thought and just give you this thought. So why is John the Baptist's life so encouraging? Now, I think it's so encouraging because if you think of prophets that have come before Jesus, uh, come before John the Baptist, you think, how can John the Baptist be this great prophet that's greater than all the prophets? I mean, think about all the prophets that came before John the Baptist. I mean, think about Elijah. I mean, Elijah did all these miracles, Mount Carmel, you know, all these things. But John came just in the spirit and power of Elijah. But remember, John the Baptist didn't perform any miracles. So what did he do? He came, he preached the word of God, he baptized believers. You know, and I think something that's encouraging about John the Baptist's life is he is a prophet that everyone can emulate. Right? Because you, you can't, you can't like, you know, do all these miracles, bring fire down from heaven, but you know what? You can preach God's word. You can be bold in preaching God's word. You can increase as Jesus is, uh, you can decrease as Jesus increases in your life. You know, you can encourage people to get baptized and you can teach them the word of God. So John the Baptist was simply a bold preacher and teacher of God's word. And I think something encouraging about John the Baptist's life is it's something that we can relate to. It's something we can try and emulate where we can preach God's word in the face of adversity. And we may have doubts as well. But yet that doesn't, take away from the great things that we can do for God. So hopefully you learned something there and John the Baptist's life is an encouragement for you. Um, let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that um, we have this example of John the Baptist. And I thank you that, Lord, uh, you know, he wasn't this great miracle-working prophet. He was simply a preacher and teacher of God's word. And it's something that, you know, we can strive to be in our lives. So we thank you, Lord, for John the Baptist's example we thank you that how it encourages us and how you exalted him lord as he humbled himself and knew his place um, under you so thank you we pray these things in your precious name amen